Hi and welcome to my channel. Today we are going to discuss about the nervous system. The nervous system is a major communicating and control system within the body. It works with the endocrine system to control many body functions. The nervous system provides a rapid and short acting response and the endocrine system provides a slower but often more sustained response. The two systems work together to maintain homeostasis. The nervous system consists of the brain, spinal cord and nerves. Constantly receives signals about changes within the body as well as the external environment. It then processes the information, decides what action to be taken and sends electrical and chemical signals to the cell, telling them how to respond. The nervous system also powers our ability to learn, feel, create and experience motion. What are the functions of the nervous system? How it works? The different divisions of the nervous system coordinate in carrying out its functions. It receive information from the external environment through the sense organs such as eyes, ears, skin, nose and tongue. Monitor conditions inside the body by means of internal senses including baroreceptors and chemoreceptors. Our nervous system makes constant adjustments in response to the Continuous changing internal and external environments. Coordinate muscles, movements and endocrine functions. It carry out cognitive functions such as learning, reasoning, memory, language and decision making. The nervous system contains two main divisions, the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. The central nervous system consists of the brain and spinal cord. The peripheral nervous system consists of the vast network of nerves throughout the body. In brief, the peripheral nerve system consists of everything outside of the brain and spinal cord. However, because the nervous system performs so many different functions, it is helpful to further subdivide the peripheral nervous system. Peripheral nervous system divides into two, sensory and motor. Sensory division carries signals from nerve endings to CNS. Motor division carries signals from CNS to rest of the body. Then the sensory division again divides into two, somatic and visceral. Somatic carries signals from skin, bones, joints and muscles. Visceral carries signals from viscera of heart, lungs, stomach and bladder. Somatic is a general term referring to parts of the body like the bones, skin and musculoskeletal system. Visceral is a term that is used for referring to internal organs and vascular system. Motor division again divides into two, somatic and autonomic. Somatic motor allows voluntary movements of the skeletal system. Autonomic motor provides automatic activities such as control of blood pressure and heart rate. Autonomic motor again divides into two divisions, sympathetic and parasympathetic. Sympathetic arouses the body for action. Parasympathetic division has a calming effect. The brain is divided into four main parts, the cerebrum and its lobes, the diencephalon composed of the hypothalamus and thalamus, the brainstem composed of the medulla oblongata, pons, midbrain and reticular formation, and the cerebellum. Two types of cells make up the nervous system, neurons and neuroglia. Neurons are the excitable impulse conducting cells that perform the work of the nervous system while neuroglia protect the neurons. The basic unit of the nervous system, the neuron, transmits impulses or messages. Some neurons are motor, causing purposeful physical movement or mobility, and some are sensory, resulting in the ability to perceive stimulation through one sensory organs or sensory perception. Some process information and some retain information. When a neuron receives an impulse from another neuron, the effect may be excitation or increasing action or inhibition, decreasing the action. Afferent neurons, also known as sensory neurons, are specialized to send impulses towards the CNS, away from the PNS. Afferent neurons are motor nerve cells that carry signals away from the CNS to the cells in the PNS. Each neuron has a cell body or soma, short branching process called dendrites and a single axon. Many axons are covered by a white lipid 
covering called myelin sheath. Myelinated axons appear whitish and therefore are also called white mat. Non-myelinated axons have a grayish cast and are called gray mat. Myelinated axons have gaps in the myelin called nodes of runway. The nodes of runway play a major role in the impulse conduction. When the myelin is impaired, the impulses cannot travel from the brain to the rest of the body, such as in patients with multiple sclerosis. We will see the functions of the parts of a neuron. So first is dendrites. Dendrites receive signals from other cells. Then cell body organizes and gives the cell function. Cell membrane protects the cell, acts on hillocks, generates impulses in the neuron. Nucleus. Nucleus controls the entire neuron. Protein synthesis also takes place in nucleus. Nodes of runway allow diffusion of ions. Axon transfers signal to other cells. Myelin sheath increases the speed of the signal. Axon terminal forms junctions with other cells. Swan cell produces the myelin sheath. In the peripheral nervous system, the myelin sheath is found when Schwann cell wrap themselves around the axon, laying down multiple layers of cell membrane. It's inside layers that form the myelin sheath. The nucleus and the most of the cytoplasm of a Schwann cell are located in the outermost layer. This outermost layer is called neurilemma. It's essential for an injured nerve to regenerate. In the CNS, the myelin sheath is formed by oligodendrocytes. Unlike swan cells, which wrap themselves completely around one axon, one oligodendrocyte form their myelin sheath for several axons. Specifically, the nucleus of the cell is located away from the myelin sheath and outward projections from the cell wrap around the axons of nearby nerves. As a result, if there is no neurilemma which prevents intuited CNS neurons from regenerating, this explains why paralysis resulting from a severe spinal cord injury is currently permanent, although researchers continue to explore possible solutions. Next cell is neuroglia. Neuroglia cells, sometimes referred to as a glial cells, which vary in size and shape, provide protection, structure, and nutrition for the neurons. They are classified into four types astroglial cells, ependymal cells, oligodendrocytes, and microglial cells. These cells are also part of the blood brain barrier and help regulate cerebrospinal fluid. Not all nerve fibers are myelinated. However, because myelin helps speed impulse conduction and myelinated fibers conduct, Nerve impulses more slowly. Typically, unmyelinated nerve fibers perform functions in which speed isn't essential, such as stimulating the secretion of stomach acid. In contrast, nerve fibers stimulate a skeletal muscle where speed is more essential or myelinated. Synapse is a junction between any two communicating neurons. The actual gap between neurons is known as the synaptic cleft. Neurons conduct intracellular communication across these gaps. The nervous system requires impulse transmission through neuron chains that are functionally connected by synapse. A neuron carrying an impulse into a synapse is called a presynaptic neuron. The neuron receiving this impulse is called a postsynaptic neuron. The process of the impulse crossing the synaptic cleft is called synaptic transmission. Most neurons function as both presynaptic and postsynaptic neurons. Synaptic transmission occurs in one direction carried by biochemicals, that is, neurotransmitters. There are three classes of neurons sensory neurons, interneurons, and motor neurons. Each neuron type fulfills one of the three general functions of the nervous system. Sensory neurons, sensory or afferent neurons, detect stimuli such as touch pressure, heat, cold, or chemicals, and then transmit information about the stimuli to the CNS. Interneurons. Interneurons are found only in the CNS, connect the incoming sensory pathways with the outgoing motor pathways. Besides receiving, processing, and storing information, the connections made by these neurons make each of us unique in how we think, 
feel or act motor neurons motor or efferent neurons relay messages from the brain which the brain emits in response to stimuli to the muscle or gland cells the next we will see the types of neurons neurons vary greatly in both size and shape they also vary according to the type number and length of projections then first one is multipolar neurons multipolar neurons have one axon and multiple dendrites this is the most common type of neuron and include most neurons of the brain and spinal cord bipolar neurons have two processes an axon and a dendrite with the cell body in between the two processes these neurons can be found in the retina of the eye and olfactory nerve in the nose unipolar neurons unipolar neurons have one process an axon that extends from the cell body before branching in a t shape these neurons mostly reside in the sensory nerves of the peripheral nervous system in nervous system part 1 we have discussed about nervous system divisions of nervous system and cells of nervous system and their function so central nervous system is divided into two main parts brain and spinal cord in this central nervous system part 2 video we will discuss about brain the brain is the largest and most complex portion of the nervous system it controls perception movement sensation thinking and many other physiological aspects the sections of the brain include two cerebral hemispheres the diencephalon the brain stem and the cerebellum there are approximately 100 billion multipolar neurons in the brain as well as axonal branches that allow these neurons to communicate throughout the nervous system the brain and the spinal cord are connected via the brain stem which allows communication to flow in both directions the spinal cord also provides a two way communication between the central nervous system and peripheral nervous system the organs of the cns are surrounded by bones fluid and membranes the largest part cerebrum coordinates sensory and motor functions and higher mental functions such as memory and reasoning the diencephalon processes additional sensory information the nerve pathways of the brain stem connect nervous system components and regulate certain visceral activities the cerebellum coordinates all anterior muscular movements the brain is designed as a central cavity surrounded first by gray matter and then by white matter the surface of the cerebral hemispheres are highly folded and covered by superficial layer of gray matter called the cerebral cortex the gray matter consists of mostly of neuron cell bodies and into neurons whereas the white matter consists of myelinated fiber tracts the white matter contains bundles of axons that connect one part of the brain to another this pattern is different in the spinal cord in which the gray matter is located in the center and the white matter is outside the brain has three main parts four brain which consists of cerebrum and diencephalon mid brain consists of tectum cerebral aqueduct and cerebral peduncles hind brain which consists of cerebellum pons and medulla oblongata the subdivisions of a brain is cerebrum diencephalon brain stem and cerebellum first we will see cerebrum the cerebrum is divided into two halves the right and left hemispheres longitudinal fissure divides the cerebrum into right and left cerebral hemispheres the bulk of the cerebrum is white matter which consists of bundles of myelinated nerve fibers called tracts tracts carry impulses from one part of the cerebrum to the other or from the cerebrum to the other parts of a brain or spinal cord most of the tracks that pass from one hemisphere to the other travel through a large bridge called the corpus callosum this arrangement allows the brain's two hemispheres to communicate with each other 
The surface of the cerebrum, called the cerebral cortex, consists of a thin layer of grey matter. Even though the layer is thin, 40% of the brain mass is grey matter. Masses of grey matter is called basal nuclei or sometimes called basal ganglia, lie deep within the cerebrum. These stretches play a role in the control of movement. Other tracks which carry information back and forth between the brain and spinal cord. These tracks are extensions of the ascending or sensory spinothalamic tracks and the descending motor, corticospinal tracks. Others carry impulses from the cortex to nerve centers of the brain and spinal cord. Beneath the cerebral cortex is white matter, comprising most of the cerebrum. It contains myelinated axon bundles, some of which pass from one cerebral hemisphere to the other. The tracks cross in the brainstem, with the right side of the brain sending impulses to the left side of the body, the left side of the body sending impulses to the right side of the body. Now we will see the lobes of the cerebral cortex. Frontal lobe forms the anterior portion of each cerebral hemisphere. Parietal lobe lies posteriorly to the frontal lobe. Temporal lobe lies below the frontal and parietal lobes. Occipital lobe forms the posterior part of each cerebral hemisphere. Insula lies under the frontal, parietal and temporal lobes deep within the lateral sulcus forming a portion of the brain floor. Now let us see the functions of each lobe. Each lobe have different functions. Frontal lobe. Frontal lobe is having the functions of thinking language, that is Broca's area, the area we will be discussing in a moment. Problem solving, voluntary movements, spontaneity, memory, initiation, judgment, impulse control, social behavior and sexual behavior. Temporal lobe is having the functions of auditory sensation, hearing, attention, reading, language, Comprehension, that is Wernick's area, memory, long-term memory, sexual behavior. Parietal lobe has two functional regions to receive sensory nerve impulses and translate them into sensation and perception. To integrate the sensory, visual and other information from a variety of sources and create what we perceive. Occipital lobe at the back of the brain contains a center responsible for visual perception, sight. As we will see the localization of functions. The different areas of the cerebrum are associated with specific functions. The prefrontal cortex is responsible for executive functions, example, planning for the future, problem solving, and organizing multiple tasks. The motor cortex is involved in the movement of skeletal muscles. The sensory cortex receives and reprocesses all the information received from the sense organs and from sensory cells, those that produce sensation of pressure, pain and warmth. Visual cortex processes information received from the retina of the eye. The angular gyrus is involved in processes related to language, number processing and spatial cognition and memory retrieval. Wernick's area is located in the left side of the brain and is responsible for the comprehension of speech. Broca's area is a region in the front lobe of the dominant hemisphere, usually the left, involved in putting thoughts into words and speech production. The auditory cortex processes auditory information, that is sound. The insula or insular cortex is a distinct but hidden part of the cerebral cortex fold deep within the lateral sulcus. It is believed to have diverse functions linked to consciousness, memory, learning, taste, autonomic control, equilibrium, visceral sensation and emotional response. The limbic system sometimes called the emotional brain. The limbic system is the seat of emotion and learning. Emotions such as hunger, thirst, fear, sex drive and other motivations. It is formed by a complex set of stretches that encircle the corpus callosum and thalamus. In brief, it links areas of the lower brainstem which control autonomic function with areas in the cerebral cortex 
associated with higher mental functions. Two key structures of the limbic system include the hippocampus and amygdala, feelings of anger, fear, sexual feelings, sorrow and pressure result only because of a functioning limbic system. Next is diencephalon. The diencephalon provides a functional link between the cerebral hemispheres and the rest of the CNS. It contains three prayer stretches, the thalamus, hypothalamus and epithalamus. Thalamus acts as a uh, relay station for sensory impulses going to cerebral cortex for integration and motor impulses entering and leaving the cerebral hemispheres. It also has a role in memory. The epithalamus structure is linked to the pineal gland which secretes the hormone melatonin responsible for sleep-wake cycles. Hypothalamus is closely associated with the pituitary gland and produces two hormones, antidiuretic hormone and oxytocin. It is also the chief autonomic integration center and is a part of the limbic system, which is the emotional brain. The hypothalamus has many functions and these include control of body temperature, autonomic nervous system, control of fluid balance and taste, control of appetite associated with the limbic system, dealing with emotional reactions, control of sexual behaviors. These are the main functions of hypothalamus. Next, we will see about brainstem. The most superior region of the brainstem is the midbrain with descending regions including the pons and medulla oblongata. The entire brainstem only makes up about 2.5% of the total brain mass. The midbrain, pons and medulla oblongata are each about 1 inch in length. The brainstem is organized similarly to the spinal cord with deep gray matter surrounded by white matter fiber tracts. The brainstem also has nuclei of gray matter that are embedded in its white matter. This differs from the organization of the spinal cord. Behaviors needed for survival are produced in the brainstem. The brainstem creates a pathway for fiber tracts that connect higher and lower neural centers. The brainstem nuclei are also linked to the 10 pairs of the cranial nerves and are greatly involved with the innervation of the head. Between the diencephalon and pons is the portion of the brainstem known as midbrain. The cerebral pedangles are the two stalks that are located on either side of the midbrain and are frontmost part of the midbrain and act as the connectives between the rest of the midbrain and the thalamic nuclei and thus the cerebrum. As a whole, the cerebral pedangles assist in refining motor movements, learning new motor skills and converting proprioceptive information into balance and posture maintenance. It contains the largest ascending, sensory and descending motor nerve tracks that run to and from the cerebrum and from the bones. Each peduncle has a cruise cerebrae, a leg-like structure containing a large corticospinal pyramidal motor tract that descends toward the spinal cord. Other fiber tracts, the superior cerebral peduncles, connect the midbrain to the cerebellum in its dorsal region. The roof of the midbrain is called the tectum. The cerebral aqueduct is the channel connecting the third and fourth ventricles. In the midbrain, nuclei are also located throughout the surrounding white matter. The largest midbrain nuclei are the corpora quadrigemina which create four rounded protrusions on the dorsal midbrain's surface called colliculi on its posterior surface. The superior colliculi are two visual reflex centers coordinating head and eye movement. The inferior colliculi relay impulses from the auditory center. The two superior colliculi are important for visual reflexes as in tracking the movement of an object or focusing on something seen off to the side. Two inferior colliculi are important for auditory reflexes such as turning your head toward a sound or jumping at the sound of uh, loud noise. Both colliculi direct the sensory messages on to the thalamus. 
two pigmented nuclei are located on each side of the white matter of the midbrain the substantia nigra and the red nucleus the substantia nigra has a high amount of melanin pigment and appears dark in color when dopamine releasing neurons of the substantia nigra degenerate parkinson's disease results the red nucleus has a rich blood supply and iron pigment it is a part of reticular formation pons pons is lying between the midbrain and medulla oblongata the pons is a bulge in the brain stem separated dorsally from the cerebellum by the fourth ventricle it primarily contains conduction tracts that run either longitudinally transversely or dorsally three nerve pairs the trigeminal fifth one abducens sixth one and facial seventh nerves originate from the pondy nuclei The pons also contain ascending, descending and transverse tracts, longitudinal tracts interconnected with other CNS stretches. The middle cerebellar peduncles are connected to the transverse fibers that cross the anterior surface of the pons. Next is medulla oblongata. The most inferior part of the brain stem is known as the medulla oblongata. It joins the spinal cord smoothly at the level of skull foramen magnum the cranial nerves known as the vestibular cochlea glossopharyngeal vagus and hypoglossal nerves originate from the medulla it plays a vital role as a center of autonomic reflexes required for homeostasis important functional groups of visceral motor nuclei are controlled by the medulla oblongata it's cardiovascular center includes both the cardiac center and vasomotor center its respiratory center is controls respiratory rhythm rate and depth various other centers of the medulla influence hiccuping vomiting coughing swallowing and sneezing motor nucleus and motor commands to peripheral effects the cerebellum is the last subdivision of the brain that you need to cover The cerebellum is situated below and at the back of the cerebrum and like the cerebrum it is divided into two hemispheres which are linked together as you seen in figure the cerebellum has tracts of white matter called the arbor vitae which branch like a tree the surface of the cerebellum is highly convoluted it has fine gyri known as folia which have a folded appearance and transverse oriented the cerebellum is bilaterally symmetrical with a worm like worm is connecting its two hemispheres each cerebellar hemisphere is divided into anterior posterior and floccular nodular lobes the cerebellum has its own thin outer cortex of gray matter internalized white matter arbor vitae these paired masses include the dentate nuclei and the neurons of the cerebellum contain large parkinchi cells uniquely distributing axons through the white matter to synapse with the central cerebral nuclei superior middle and inferior cerebellar peduncles connect the cerebellum with other brain stretches the function of the cerebellum is to coordinate smooth movement of the skeletal muscles which include maintaining muscle tone that enables an upright posture and the ability to stand and walk smoothness on to accuracy of actions for example walking talking writing feeding and the ability to learn patterns of coordinated movements learning to walk the cerebellum receives sensory messages concerning the positions of limbs muscles and joints it uses this information to find tune efferent skeletal muscle uh, messages to coordinate position balance and movement the effect is smooth coordinated movement such as touching the end of your nose with your finger while your eyes are closed people who are proficient at keyboarding either typing or playing piano have a reflexive memory when they were first learned to keyboard it may have been necessary for them to watch their fingers move to each key but by now their cerebellum has fine tuned messages so that keyboarding seems effortless here we conclude the divisions of brain
in this nervous system part 3 video we will cover protection of cns blood brain barrier ventricles protection of the cns the brain and the spinal cord are delicate structures surrounded and protected by an outer covering of skin and bone cranium is protected in the brain and vertebrae is protected in the spinal cord and by layers of connective tissue called meninges and by cerebro spinal fluid the meninges are three layers of different types of connective tissue that cover and protect the brain and spinal cord the first layer is dura mater dura mater is the outermost layer is made up of fibrous tough white connective tissue it is a strong outer sac that encloses the brain spinal cord and the cerebro spinal fluid it has many blood vessels and nerves and attaches to the inside of the cranial cavity it also extends inward between the brain lobes to form protective partitions it continues into the vertebral canal to surround the spinal cord ending in a sac at its end the dura mater has two layers of fibrous connective tissue its periosteal layer which is more superficial attaches to the periosteum the inner surface of the skull around the spinal cord there is no dural periosteal layer the meningeal layer actually covers the brain continuing caudally as the spinal dura mater in the vertebral canal the two dural layers of the brain are fused in most areas in certain places they separate enclosing dural venous sinuses which collect blood from the brain and channel it to the internal jugular veins in the neck next is arachnoid mater arachnoid mater is a delicate cobweb like layer lying beneath the dura mater that contains most of the blood vessels it is the mid layer the subarachnoid space separates the arachnoid and the pia mater it contains delicate connective tissue through which cerebro spinal fluid circulates around the brain and the spinal cord the innermost layer is called pia mater that follows the contours of the brain and spinal cord and adheres tightly to the highly folded surface the meninges continue down within the spinal cavity for some distance below the spinal cord the thin pia mater has many blood vessels and nerves that nourish the brain and spinal cord the pia mater is closely aligned with the surface of these organs it is comprised of many tiny blood vessels and delicate connective tissue there are also spinal meninges discussed later when we cover the spinal cord meningitis is the inflammation of the meninges next we will see the cerebro spinal fluid csf is produced by specialized ependymal cells in the small red choroid plexus of the ventricles of the brain a bed of capillaries that is small blood vessels called a choroid plexus exist in the walls of the ventricles most csf is formed in the lateral ventricles ependymal cells cover the capillaries and take what they need to make csf from capillary blood arachnoid villi are knob like projections that protrude superiorly through the dura mater into the superior sagittal sinus they absorb csf into the venous blood of the sinus in adults clusters of arachnoid villi form large arachnoid granulations where csf is actually absorbed into the venous circulation csf also enters the meninges subarachnoid space via the two lateral apertures and the single median aperture and is reabsorbed into the blood csf surrounds the brain and spinal cord maintaining a stable ionic concentration and protecting cns stretches CSF is a clear colorless fluid that circulates between the ventricles and the subarachnoid space to bathe the brain and the spinal cord the cilia of the ependymal cells gravity and pulsation of arteries in the brain are responsible for the circulation of CSF approximately 500 ml 
of CSFR produced daily. The same amount of CSF reabsorbed through a arachnoid villi back into the bloodstream every day. So there are only approximately 100 to 160 ml of CSF present at any one time. Cerebrospinal fluid is similar to blood plasma but contains less protein. CSF contains more sodium chloride and hydrogen ions but less calcium and potassium than blood plasma. CSF circulates within the ventricular system of the brain. The majority of CSF is produced within the two lateral ventricles. From here, CSF passes through the interventricular foramina to the third ventricle, then to the cerebral aqueduct, then to the fourth ventricle. From the fourth ventricle, the fluid passes into the subarachnoid space through four openings. The four openings are the central canal of the spinal cord, the median aperture and the two lateral aperture. CSF is present within the subarachnoid space which covers the brain and the spinal cord and stretches below the end of the spinal cord to the sacrum. Now let us see the important functions of the CSF. The CSF allows the brain to fold in the cranial cavity. Without the CSF, nerve tissue would be damaged by the sheer weight of the brain against the bony floor of the cranial cavity. Then the CSF provides the protection. CSF cushions the brain from contact with the skull when sudden movements of the head occur. It facilitates chemical stability. The CSF rinses metabolic wastes from the brain and the spinal cord and helps regulate the chemical environment. One way it does this is by removing excess hydrogen ions. It provides nutrients. The CSF provides the CNS tissues with some nutrients like glucose. This is all about the protection of CNS. Now we will move to blood brain barrier. The capillaries in the brain develop differently from capillaries elsewhere in the body. The endothelium of the capillary walls has a thick basement membrane and is lined with the astrocytes to form a unique structure, the blood-brain barrier. The brain requires a constant internal environment to function normally. To maintain this, the blood-brain barrier acts to selectively allow certain molecules to pass and to keep others from reaching the brain. Before blood-borne substances can move from brain capillaries to reach neurons, three layers of the blood-brain barrier await them. The capillary wall endothelium, the thick basal lamina surrounding every capillary's external side, bulk-like feet of the astrocytes that are bound to the capillaries. Astrocytes cover the non-myelin portions of neurons and blood vessels in the CNS forming a blood-brain barrier. This barrier allows astrocytes to regulate what can leave the bloodstream to enter the CNS, protecting the CNS from potentially toxic chemicals. Astrocytes also regulate the contents of the cerebrospinal fluid by absorbing excess neurotransmitters and potassium ions. The junctions between the cells of the blood-brain barrier are tightly fused and leak-proof, which separates the blood from the CSF. Small molecules in solution such as oxygen, glucose and alcohol can pass rapidly through the blood-brain barrier, but larger particles cannot because their movement is highly regulated. This protects brain tissue from toxic substances and pathogens to enter, but may also be a barrier to some potentially useful medications. Now let us see the ventricles of the brain. Interconnected cavities known as ventricles exist within the cerebral hemispheres and brainstem. They are continuous with the spinal cord, central canal and also contain CSF. Within each cerebral hemisphere are large C-shaped chambers known as the paired lateral ventricles. 
they demonstrate the pattern of a cerebral growth and lie close together anteriorly a thin median membrane called the septum pellucidum separates them each lateral ventricle is connected to the thin third ventricle which is surrounded by the diencephalon via a channel known as the interventricular foramen the third ventricle connects to the fourth ventricle via the cerebral aqueduct which runs through the midbrain in this nervous system part 4 video we will cover spinal cord spinal cord are protected by an outer covering of skin and vertebrae and by the layers of connective tissue called meninges and by cerebrospinal fluid the spinal cord is a thin column of nerves elongated almost cylindrical leading from the brain to the vertebral canal surrounded by the meninges and cerebrospinal fluid the spinal cord is continuous above with the medulla oblongata and extends from the upper border of the atlas to the lower border of the first lumbar vertebra it is approximately 45 cm long in adult males and is about the thickness of the little finger the spinal cord provides two ways of communication to and from the brain and contains the spinal reflex centers the spinal cord is enlarged in the cervical and lumbar regions to accommodate the number of nerve fibers going to and from the limbs 31 pairs of spinal nerves attach to the spinal cord between vertebrae we will learn more about these nerves when we cover the peripheral nervous system there are two layers of spinal cord an outer layer of white matter and an inner layer made up of gray matter which surrounds a small central canal the spinal cord is enclosed within the vertebral canal which forms a protective ring of bone around the cord other protective coverings include the spinal meninges which are three layers of connective tissue coverings which extend around the spinal cord the spinal meninges are continuous with those of the brain the spinal meninges consist of pia mater inner layer arachnoid mater middle layer and dura mater the outermost layer which consist of a dense irregular connective tissue in the spinal cord the dura mater has a single layer and is not attached to the vertebral column in the inner surface of the dura mater contacts the outer surface of the arachnoid mater which is the middle meningeal layer of the spine an epidural space exists between the dura mater and vertebrae which is padded by fat and vein network csf fills the subarachnoid space which lies between the arachnoid and pia mater meninges the dural and arachnoid membranes extend inferiorly to the s2 level which is far below the end of the spinal cord that ends between the l1 and l2 levels the spinal cord ends between the l1 and l2 levels the subarachnoid space inside the meningeal sac inferior to the lumbar region is an excellent spot for the removal of csf this procedure is called a lumbar puncture or spinal tap as you can see in figure a cross section of the cord shows both gray and white matter the gray matter is in the center of the cord and arranged in an h letter the points of which are called horns the gray matter is composed of dendrites cell bodies and short and myelinated neurons that is interneurons these interneurons synapse with other neurons in the spinal cord to carry a message from the cord up to the brain or out to the body the white matter of the spinal cord contains myelinated axons of neurons arranged in columns axons in ascending columns carry messages to the brain while axons in descending columns carry messages away from the brain and the axons are grouped together in tracks with a similar function figure shows how a sensory that is primary neuron from the skin goes to the spinal cord there it synapses with an interneuron 
so its message can be eventually carried to the brain on myelinated axons in the lateral column on the left side of the cord. The functions of interneuron is to facilitate communication between sensory and motor neurons with relatively short distances. Descending tracts from the cerebral cortex carry motor messages on myelinated axons in the anterior and lateral columns of the cord. The human spinal cord is divided into 31 different segments. At every segment, right and left pairs of spinal nerves form, that is mixed sensory and motor nerves. Six to eight motor nerve rootlets branch out of the right and left ventrolateral sulci in a very orderly manner. Nerve rootlets combine to form nerve roots. Each segment of the spinal cord is associated with a pair of ganglia called dorsal root ganglia which are situated just outside of the spinal cord. These ganglia contain cell bodies of sensory neurons. Axons of these sensory neurons travel into the spinal cord via the dorsal roots. The spinal cord is supplied with blood by three arteries that run along its length starting in the brain and the many arteries that approach it through the sides of the spinal column. The three longitudinal arteries are called anterior spinal artery, right posterior spinal arteries, left posterior spinal arteries. These travel in the subarachnoid space and send branches into the spinal cord. The spinal cord plays a wider role in various aspects of the body's functioning. They are carrying signals from the brain. The spinal cord receives signal from the brain that control movement and autonomic functions. Carrying information to the brain. The spinal cord nerves also transmit messages to the brain from the body, such as sensations of touch, pressure, and pain. Reflex responses. The spinal cord may also act independently of the brain in conducting motor reflexes. One example is a patellar reflex, which causes a person's knee to involuntarily jerk when tapped in a certain spot. These functions of the spinal cord transmit the nerve impulses for movement, sensation, pressure, temperature, pain and more. These are all about spinal cord. Here we conclude central nervous system. Now we will move on to peripheral nervous system. In this nervous system part 5 video, we will cover peripheral nervous system. The nervous system is mainly divided into two parts, central nervous system and peripheral nervous system. We have covered already central nervous system in previous videos. Peripheral nervous system is divided into two, sensory division and motor division. The sensory division is afferent division which carries signals from nerve endings to CNS. The motor or efferent division which carries signals from CNS to rest of the body. The sensory again divided into somatic and visceral sensory. Somatic division carries signals from skin, bone, joints and muscles. The visceral sensory division carries signals from viscera of heart, lungs, stomach and bladder. Somatic is a general term referring to parts of the body like the bones, skin and musculoskeletal system. Visceral is a term that is used for referring to internal organs and vascular system. The motor or efferent division which carries information from CNS to the rest of the body is divided again into two, somatic motor and autonomic motor. This autonomic motor again divided into two, sympathetic division and parasympathetic division. The somatic motor allows voluntary movements of a skeleton muscles, while autonomic motor provides automatic activities such as control of blood pressure and heart rate. The peripheral nervous system consists of the peripheral nerves connecting the central nervous system to other parts of the body. The nerves of the PNS are classified as either cranial nerves 
or spinal nerves based on the location in which they arise. Then we will see nerves. Nerves of PNS. A nerve consists of numerous neurons collected into bundles. Each bundle has several coverings of protective connective tissue. Endoneurium is a delicate tissue surrounding each individual fiber which is continuous with the septa that pass inward from the perineurium. Perineurium is a smooth connective tissue surrounding each bundle of fibers. Epineurium is the fibrous tissue which surrounds and encloses a number of bundles of nerve fibers. Most large nerves are covered by epineurium. Endoneurium covers individual fiber. Perineurium covers bundle of fibers. Epineurium covers number of bundles of nerve fibers. Ganglia are groups of neuron cell bodies that are related to peripheral nerves. Nuclei are groups of neuron cell bodies in the CNS. The ganglia that are associated with afferent nerve fibers have cell bodies of sensory neurons. These are also known as dorsal root ganglia. The ganglia that are associated with the efferent nerve fibers mostly have cell bodies of autonomic motor neurons. Afferent is always sensory. Efferent is always motor. Let us see sensory receptors. Sensory receptors are specialized endings of sensory neurons respond to different stimuli inside and outside the body. The brain can then process awareness of the stimulus, that is sensation, and interpret the meaning of the stimulus, that is perception. Two main sensory receptors are tonic and phasic receptors. The main difference between the tonic and phasic receptors is that tonic receptors slowly adapt to the situation or stimulus, whereas phasic receptors rapidly adapt to stimulus. Types of sensory receptors. Sensory receptors are classified by what stimuli they detect, their location in the body, and the complexity of their stretches. So, first one is chemoreceptors. These receptors respond to chemicals in solution, including smelled or tasted molecules, changes in body chemistry, and changes in interstitial fluid chemistry. Chemoreceptive neurons are also found in the carotid bodies in the neck and aortic bodies between the primary branches of the aortic arc. Then we have mechanoreceptors. Mechanoreceptors respond to mechanical forces such as pressure, touch, stretching and vibrations. There are three classes. They are tactile receptors, baroreceptors and proprioceptors. Tactile receptors sense pressure, touch and vibration. Fine touch and pressure receptors allow us to sense sources of stimulation that include exact location, shape, size, movement and texture. Crude touch and pressure receptors only allow generalized sensations. Next is baroreceptors. Baroreceptors detect pressure changes in blood vessel walls and in areas of the urinary, reproductive and digestive tract. Next is proprioceptors. Proprioceptors sense positions of skeletal muscles and joints and tension in the ligaments and tendons. These proprioceptor receptors originate in muscles and joints and contribute to the maintenance of a balance and posture. Proprioceptive signals are transmitted to the central nervous system where they are integrated with information from other sensory systems such as the visual system and the vestibular system to create an overall representation of body position, movement and acceleration. The way we can tell that an arm is raised above our head when our eyes are closed is an example of proprioception. Other examples may include your ability to sense the surface you are standing upon even when you are not looking at the surface. Proprioception comes from sensory nerve endings that provide our brain 
with the information of the limb position there are specialized nerves in your muscles and joints that communicate with your brain and tell it what position your joint is in and how much stretch or strain is on the muscles surrounding a joint the nerves surround each muscle bundle creating a system of communication with your brain about what is happening to the muscles and the joints of your body next is nociceptors nociceptors respond to stimuli that may be damaging such as extreme heat or cold excessive pressure and inflammatory chemicals resulting in pain nociceptors are common in the superficial skin around blood vessel walls inside joint capsules and in the periosteum of bones painful sensations are carried on two types of fibers called type A and type C fibers the myelinated type A fibers carry fast pain sensations such as from a vaccination or a deep cut the type C fibers carry slow pain which is described as pain that feels aching and burning photoreceptors photoreceptors respond to light for example the receptors in the retinas of the eye thermoreceptors thermoreceptors respond to temperature changes and are free nerve endings in the dermis liver skeletal muscles and hypothalamus although not structurally different from each other there are 3 to 4 more called receptors to every warm receptors thermoreceptor are phasic receptors that quickly adapt to stable temperature we have mixed nerves in this manner called sensory and motor nerves are arranged in separate groups or tracks outside the spinal cord when sensory and motor nerves are enclosed within the same sheath of connective tissue they are called mixed nerves mixed nerves contains sensory and motor fibers and transmit impulses in both directions now let us see the autonomic nervous system The autonomic nervous system controls involuntary responses to regulate physiological functions. The brain and the spinal cord of the central nervous system are connected with organs that have smooth muscles by ganglionic neurons such as the heart, bladder, other cardiac, exocrine and endocrine related organs. The most notable physiological effects from autonomic activity are pupil constriction and dilation. and the salivation of saliva the autonomic nervous system is always activated but is either in the sympathetic or parasympathetic state depending on the situation one state can overshadow the other resulting in a release of different kinds of neurotransmitters autonomic nervous system consists of two divisions the sympathetic division and the parasympathetic division These two divisions have separate neural pathways and perform different functions however they often both innervate the same organ sympathetic nervous system the sympathetic division prepares the body for physical activity the sympathetic system is activated during a fight or flight situation in which mental stress or physical danger is encountered because this division prepares someone to fight or flee from danger its effects are called the fight or flight reaction neurotransmitters such as norepinephrine and epinephrine are released which increases heart rate and blood flow in the certain areas like muscles while simultaneously decreasing activities of non critical functions for survival like digestion the systems are independent to each other which allows activation of certain parts of the body while others remain rested in contrast the parasympathetic division has a calming effect on body functions so the parasympathetic system allows the body to function in a rest and digest state the parasympathetic system allows the body to function in a rest and digest state primarily using the neurotransmitter acetylcholine as a mediator consequently when the parasympathetic system dominates the body there are increases in salivation and activities in digestion while heart rate and other sympathetic response decreases 
Unlike the sympathetic system, humans have some voluntary controls in the parasympathetic system. The most prominent example of this control are urination and defecation. The chart contrasts some of the effects of these two systems. Sympathetic division increases alertness, heart rate. It dilates bronchial tubes to increase air flow in the lungs. It dilates blood vessels of skeletal muscles to increase blood flow. It inhibits intestinal motility. It stimulates secretion of thick salivary mucus and stimulates sweat glands. It stimulates adrenal medulla to secrete epinephrine. has no effect on the urinary bladder or internal sphincter. It causes fight or flight response. Parasympathetic division has a calming effect, decreases heart rate. It constricts bronchial tubes to decrease air flow in lungs, has no effect on blood vessels of skeletal muscles like sympathetic division. It stimulates intestinal motility and secretion to promote digestion. It stimulates secretion of thin salivary mucus. Parasympathetic division has no effect on sweat glands and adrenal medulla like sympathetic nervous system. Parasympathetic nervous system stimulates the bladder wall to contract the internal sphincter to relax to cause urination. It causes rest and digest state. The enteric nervous system is a lesser known division of autonomic nervous system Located only around the digestive tract, this system allows for local control without input from the sympathetic or parasympathetic branches. Though it can still receive and respond to sickness from the rest of the body, the enteric system is responsible for various functions related to gastrointestinal system. Now we will cover cranial nerves. The brain has 12 pairs of cranial nerves to relay messages to the rest of the body while still part of the peripheral nervous system. These nerves, unlike the spinal nerves, arise directly from the brain. Each cranial nerve is identified by a name, suggestive of its function, as well as a number. Designated by a Roman numeral, the nerves are numbered 1 to 12, according to their order, beginning in the anterior portion of the brain. Some cranial nerves contain only sensory fibers. Some contain motor fibers, while others contain both sensory and motor fibers. The first cranial nerve is olfactory nerves, is a sensory. These are the nerves of sense of smell. The second one is optic nerves, also sensory. These are the nerves of the sense of sight. Third one is oculomotor, is motor, it helps for eye movements. The fourth one is trochlear, is a motor again for eye movements. Fifth one is trigeminal, it's a sensory and motor, it's a mix it. Helps for muscles of mastication, that is chewing. Teeth, eyes, skin, tongue for sensation of touch, pain and temperature. The sixth one is abdescence is again motor helping for eye movement the seventh one is facial that is mixed one sensory and motor it helps for tasty buds facial muscles tear and salivary glands eighth nerve is vestibular cochlea is a sensory helps for hearing and balances in near ear the ninth one is glossopharyngeal is a sensory and motor mixer it is in pharyngeal muscles, helping for swallowing and salivation. The tenth one is vagus, sensory and motor, that is mixed. It is in internal organs, helping for movement and secretions of internal organs. The eleventh one is spinal accessory, that is motor. It is in neck and back muscles. And the twelfth one is hypoglossal, it is a motor is in tongue muscles, helping for the movement of tongues. Now we will move on to spinal nerves. For the rest of the body, spinal nerves are responsible for somatosensory information. The spinal nerves arise from the spinal cord. 
Usually these arise as a web that is plexus of interconnected nerve roots that arrange to form single nerves. These nerves control the functions of the rest of the body. All spinal nerves carry sensory and motor messages. So they are composed of both unipolar and multipolar neuron axons. Bipolar neuron axons are only found in some cranial nerves. Each spinal nerve splits into two nerve roots as it approaches the cord, a dorsal root and a ventral root. The dorsal root has a bulge, whereas the ventral root does not. The bulge is a ganglion group of cell bodies of the unipolar neurons. Unipolar neurons have their cell bodies pushed off to the side. So the dorsal root carries afferent or sensory messages, while the ventral root is composed of multipolar neuron axons that carry efferent or motor messages. In humans, there are 31 pairs of spinal nerves. 8 cervical, 12 thoracic, 5 lumbar, 5 sacral and 1 coccygeal. These nerve roots are named according to the spinal vertebrae which they are adjacent to. In the cervical region, the spinal nerve roots come out above the corresponding vertebrae. That is, the nerve root between the skull and first cervical vertebrae is called spinal nerve C1. Between C7 and T1, the cervical nerve 8 arises. From the thoracic region to the coccygeal region, the spinal nerve roots come out below the corresponding vertebrae. In the lumbar and the sacral region, the spinal nerve roots travel within the dural sac and they travel below the level of L2 as the coda equina. Now we'll see cervical spinal nerves. Cervical spinal nerves C1 to C4. The first four cervical spinal nerves C1 through C4 split and recombine to produce a variety of nerves that serve the neck and back of head that we call as cervical plexus. Spinal nerve C1 is called the suboccipital nerve which provides motor innervation to muscles at the base of the skull. C2 and C3 form many of the nerves of the neck providing both sensory and motor control. These include the greater occipital nerve, which provides sensation to the back of the head, the lesser occipital nerve, which provides sensation to the area behind the ears, and greater auricular nerve and the lesser auricular nerve. The phrenic nerve is a nerve essential for our survival which arises from nerve roots C3, C4 and C5 and passes downwards through the thoracic cavity in front of the root of the lung to supply the thoracic diaphragm initiating inspiration. Disease or spinal cord injury at this level will result in death due to apnea without assisted ventilation. Brachial plexus C5 to T1. The last four cervical spine nerves C5 through C8 and the first thoracic spinal nerve T1 combine to form the brachial plexus or plexus brachialis, a tangled array of nerves splitting, combining, and recombining to form the nerves that subserve the upper limb and upper back. The branches of the brachial plexus supply the skin and muscles of the upper limbs and some of the chest muscles. Five large nerves and a number of smaller ones emerge from this plexus, each with a contribution from more than one nerve root containing sensory, motor and autonomic fibers. They are axillary nerve which arises from C5 and C6. Radial nerve arises from C5, 7, 8 and T1. Muscular cutaneous nerve arises from C5, C6 and C7. Median nerve arises from C5, 7, 8 and T1. Alna nerve arises from C7, C8 and T1. And medial cutaneous nerve arises from C8 and T1. Next is lumbar plexus. 
the lumbar plexus is formed by the anterior rame of the first three and part of the fourth lumbar nerves the plexus is situated in front of the transverse process of the lumbar vertebrae and behind the psoas muscle the main branches and their nerve roots are iliohypogastric nerve arises from l1 ilioinguinal nerve arises from l1 genito femoral nerve arises from l1 and l2 lateral cutaneous nerve of thigh which arises from l2 and l3 femoral nerve arises from l2 3 and 4 obturator nerve arises from l2 3 and 4 lumbosacral trunk arises from l4 next is sacral plexus sacral plexus is formed by the anterior rami of the lumbosacral trunk and the first second and third sacral nerves the lumbosacral trunk is formed by the fifth and part of the fourth lumbar nerves it lies in the posterior wall of the pelvic cavity the sacral plexus divides into a number of branches supplying the muscles and the skin of the pelvic floor muscles around the hip joint and pelvic organs in addition to these it provides the sciatic nerve which contains fibers from l4 and l5 and s1 to s3 The sciatic nerve is the largest nerve in the body. It is about 2 cm wide as its origin. It passes through the greater sciatic foramen into the buttock, then descends through the posterior aspect of the thigh, supplying the hamstring muscles. At the level of the middle of femur, it divides to form the tibial and the common peroneal nerves. The tibial nerve descends through the popliteal fossa to the posterior aspect of the leg where it supplies muscles and skin the common peroneal nerve descends obliquely along the lateral aspect of the popliteal fossa the pudendal nerve arises from s2 s3 and s4 the peroneal branch supplies the external ns sphincter the external urethral sphincter and adjacent skin last is coccygeal plexus coccygeal plexus is a very small plexus formed by part of the fourth and fifth sacral and the coccygeal nerves the nerves from this plexus supply the skin around the coccyx and the anal area thoracic nerves the thoracic nerves do not intermingle to form plexus there are 12 pairs and the first 11 are the intercostal nerves they pass between the ribs supplying them the intercostal muscles and overlying skin the 12th pair comprise the subcostal nerves the 7th to the 12th thoracic nerves also supply the muscles and the skin of the posterior and anterior abdominal walls In this nervous system part 6 we will cover reflex act neurotransmitters neural tracts brain waves sleep and sleep patterns circle of willis a reflex action is a rapid involuntary response to a stimulus and many have a protective or survival function examples of reflex actions are pupil reflex reducing the size of the pupil in bright light to protect the retina coughing coughing prevents asphyxiation asphyxiation or suffocation which occurs when the body is deprived of oxygen blinking reflex protects the eyes by keeping the surface moist withdrawal reflex for example jerking the hands away when touching a hot surface reflex actions follows a specific nerve pathways known as reflex arc reflex arc involves the following anatomy the receptor the dendrite of a neuron receiving the stimulus the example of the stimulus is a chemical heat light or mechanical disturbances next is afferent neuron or sensory neuron a neuron that has an 
action potential carrying the signal to the CNS. Sensor receptors detect the stimulus and convert it into impulses transmitted along sensory afferent neurons to the CNS. Integrating center Either the brain or spinal cord where the signal is received from the afferent neuron and conducted to a motor neuron. This may or may not recur an interneuron. Efferent neuron a neuron that has an action potential carrying a signal away from the CNS. Motor neurons transmit the impulses along efferent neurons to a muscle or gland which responds by producing the right reaction. Effector The structure causing the effect. If this structure is skeletal muscle, it is called a somatic reflex. If the effector is a gland or smooth muscle, it is called an autonomic reflex. Synapse. A synapse is a junction between any two communicating neurons at which the nerve impulses passes from one to another. The actual gap between the neurons is known as the synaptic cleft. Neurons conduct intracellular communication across these gaps. The nervous system requires impulse transmission through neuron chains that are functionally connected by synapses. A neuron carrying an impulse into a synapse is called a presynaptic neuron. The neuron receiving this impulse is called a postsynaptic neuron. The process of the impulse crossing the synaptic cleft is called synaptic transmission. Most neurons function as both presynaptic and postsynaptic neurons. Synaptic transmission occurs in one direction carried by biochemical, that is, neurotransmitters. The axon of the presynaptic neuron breaks up into minute branches that terminate in small swellings called synaptic knobs or terminal buttons. Synaptic knobs contain spherical synaptic vesicles which store a chemical, the neurotransmitter that is released into the synaptic cleft. What is neurotransmitters? A neurotransmitter is a signal molecule a chemical messenger that is released from a presynaptic neuron and diffuses across the synaptic cleft to either excite or inhibit the target cell in order for communication to occur between neurons or between the neuron and muscle or gland. Those effector cells or neurons in close proximity to the neurotransmitter will either be stimulated or inhibited by the neurotransmitter depending upon which neurotransmitter is secreted. The action of the neurotransmitter is short-lived and any neurotransmitter not used is absorbed by the neuron to be recycled and used again or deactivated by enzymes. Some examples of neurotransmitters are acetylcholine released within the CNS and also at the neuromuscular junction, norepinephrine released within the central nervous system and also at autonomic nervous system synapses. Dopamine released within the central nervous system and also at autonomic nervous system synapses. Neurotransmitters have special characteristics. They are made in the neuron and store in vesicles in the axon terminal on the presynaptic side of a synapse. When the neuron is stimulated, they are released and produce a specific response in the neighboring target cell, that is postsynaptic cell. They are then degraded and removed or taken back into the axon terminal for reuse. Over 100 neurotransmitters have been identified and they play a major role in many of the body's activities, for example, mood, sleep, appetite, concentration or memory. It works best when present at their optimum level and adverse symptoms may result when they are out of balance. It can be depleted in many ways, for example, by stress, poor diet, genetic predisposition, drugs, and neurotoxins. Most neurotransmitters are either excitatory or inhibitory. Excitatory neurotransmitters increase the likelihood that the target cell will produce an action potential and transmit an impulse, for example, acetylcholine. 
inhibitory neurotransmitters act by reducing the membrane potential so it is further away from threshold making an pot- action potential less likely for example gamma amino butyric acid next is neural tracts within the white matter of the spinal cord are bundles of axons called tracts that serve as the routes of communication to one from the brain all the nerve fibers of a single tract have a similar origination destination and function as an example the fibers of a spinothalamic tract originate in the spinal cord that is spino and end in the thalamus thalamic in addition they all convey sensations of pain touch and temperature to the thalamus in the brain neural tracts and pathways connect distant parts of the nervous system with each other by means of bundles of nerve fibers in the white matter ascending tracts are bundles of afferent nerve fibers that carry sensory impulses from the peripheral nervous to brain for example relating to touch heat and pain the thalamus acts as a relay center directing sensory impulses to the appropriate part of the cerebral cortex for processing descending tracts are bundles of efferent nerve fibers that carry impulses from the motor cortex via the spinal cord to control movements of the body below the head the reticular activating system comprises bundles of neurons in the brain stem that are responsible for sleep wakefulness and a level of alertness the corpus callosum is a bundle of nerve fibers that cross the midline of the cerebrum enabling the transfer of information between the two cerebral hemispheres next is brain waves brain waves are based on electrical activity and normal brain functions involve continuous electrical activity of the neurons certain aspects of electrical brain activity can be recorded on an electroencephalogram which involves placing electrodes on the patient's scalp the eeg measures voltage differences between the areas of the cerebral cortex brain waves are the patterns of neuronal electrical activity that is recorded they are generated by the activity of the synapses at the surface of the cortex every individual's brain wave patterns are unique but are grouped into four primary types first is alpha waves relatively regular rhythmic synchronous waves of low amplitude that is 8 to 13 hz they usually indicate calm and relaxed wakefulness beta waves rhythmic but less regular waves that have a higher frequency than alpha waves 14 to 30 hz they occur during mental alertness such as when concentrating or looking at visual stimuli next is theta waves irregular waves that are common in children and have a low frequency that is 4 to 7 hertz they may occur in adults when concentrating delta waves is a high amplitude waves occurring in deep sleep or when something dampens the reticular activating system that is such as anesthesia if these waves exist in a conscious patient they indicate brain damage brain waves changes with brain diseases aging sensory stimuli and the chemical balance of the body next is sleep and sleep patterns sleep is a state of partial unconsciousness from which we may be aroused by stimulation it is different from coma from which a person cannot be aroused by stimulation if the person is sleeping we can arise them but if the person is in coma we cannot arise them during sleep most cortical activity that cerebral cortex is depressed but brain stem functions continue these functions include control of heart rate blood pressure and respiration the two major types of sleep are non rapid eye movement sleep and rapid eye movement sleep each of these have different patterns on an eeg stages of sleep stage 1 is non rapid eye movement relaxation begins in this arousal is very easy in this eeg shows alpha waves 
The second one is non-rapid eye movement too. Arousal is very difficult. E.g. is irregular with the sleep spindles that is short high amplitude burst. In third stage, sleep deepens and vital signs decline. On EEG, theta and delta waves appear. In fourth stage, arousal is very difficult, but wetting, nightmares, night terrors or sleep walking may occur. EEG is dominated by delta waves. The transition to REM sleep from this stage is marked by an abrupt change in EEG patterns with alpha waves reappearing. In rapid eye movement sleep, most dreaming occurs except for diaphragm and ocular muscles. The skeletal muscles are actively inhibited which prevents acting out of dreams. More oxygen is used during REM sleep than during consciousness. Next we will see about circle of Willis. The circle of Willis circulus arteriosus cerebrae is an anastomotic system of arteries that sits at the base of the brain. The brain lies in the cranial cavity and weighs between 1450 gram and 1600 gram. It receives 15% of the cardiac output and has a system of autoregulation ensuring the blood supply is constant despite positional changes. The arrangement of the arteries serving the brain is unique and they are connected to each other by structure called the cycle of willis. This arrangement ensures that blood pressure remains equal in both halves of the brain. If one of the arteries serving the brain become narrower by arterial disease or thrombus, then there will be an alternative route available maintaining the essential supply of oxygen and glucose required by the brain. The circle of Willis encircles the stalk of the pituitary gland and provides important communications between the blood supply of the forebrain and hindbrain. The circle of Willis is formed when the internal carotid artery enters the cranial cavity bilaterally and divides into anterior cerebral artery and middle cerebral artery. The anterior cerebral arteries are then united by an anterior communicating artery. These connections form the anterior half of the circle of Willis. Posteriorly, the basilar artery formed by the left and right vertebral arteries branches into a left and right posterior cerebral artery forming the posterior circulation. The posterior cerebral arteries complete the circle of Willis by joining the internal carotid system anteriorly via the posterior communicating arteries. Although in an adult, the brain represents only 2% of the total body weights, it utilizes 20% of oxygen and glucose even at rest. When activities in a certain area of the brain increases, blood flow to that region also increases. Even a brief slowing of blood flow to the brain can result in unconsciousness. Further, decrease in blood flow for a couple of minutes can lead to impaired neuronal function. If the blood flow is restricted for 4 minutes or more, then it could lead to permanent brain damage. As the brain does not store glucose, there must be a continuous supply of glucose to the brain. What are the functions of the circle of willis? The circle of willis provides multiple plugs for oxygenated blood to supply the brain if any of the principal suppliers of oxygenated blood are constricted by physical pressure, occluded by disease or interrupted by injury. This redundancy of blood supply is generally termed collateral circulation.